So uh, welcome everybody to uh, the second VX1 webinar. We're gonna kind of dive in here. I wanna introduce our, our, our presenters today. So if we can click on there, let's slide to the next one there. So uh, everybody uh, kind of knows these two guys, Mike Marshall, uh, and uh, I want to introduce our special guest today, Jeff Fiber. Jeff is uh, uh, beyond being a, a, a VX1 uh, a big proponent and just big pusher for the class. He's also, for you guys who don't know, he's a J22 world champion and Etchell's world champion and past president of the class. And uh, Mike Marshall, you guys all, hopefully from the first presentation, know who Mike is. And uh, what we want to do is I'm going to kind of turn this over to Mike and Jeff and uh, let them uh, go through all the stuff that they've got. And hopefully we're going to try to get all this done in about an hour. So, uh, Mike, are you, are you online? I'm ready. Awesome. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> so, uh, big thanks, Brian and, uh, and Jeff. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining for this, uh, this round. I'm pretty excited. So, it'll be a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of give and take on it and a couple of different opinions, which will be, which will be nice to, you know, to get out to the group. Again, as last time, everything is on the screen, which is here in front of me and the camera's down there. So uh, discussion about that. Jeff's camera is clearly on an iPad or an iPhone or something where they put the camera in a reasonable location. Um, anyway, so, you know, per the request of basically everyone uh, last time we covered upwind and kind of the goal here is to cover downwind and I really wanted today to go through downwind and the two kinds of driving. So it's, it's, um, it's essentially two fairly large topics that hopefully we can break down into, uh, into a lot of, uh, smaller topics. Um, so, you know, in going through the, through the first two, I kind of just wanted to start with driving. And, you know, in the VX, when you really, and Jeff, feel free to jump in here anytime and correct me if you hear something that you don't like or do like or want to elaborate on. Um, but just as a quick overview, two kinds of driving. There's the blow through that we all talk about. It's like this holy grail of driving that's, you know, the way to do it. And, and everyone has a very small different opinion on how it should be done and how much you should backwind and has different choreography and everything that they do for it. And then there's what I call the slow turn jibe, which is the, you know, it's going to work 95% of the time in almost all the breezes. And I think the benefit of each of those can, can be found more in certain, uh, in certain places. So, you know, you might have a larger benefit uh, in lighter air for one kind and a, and a smaller benefit in heavier air uh, for that kind. And then, and then something, you know, something different in, uh, in bigger breeze. So to dive right into it, I wanted to start with this video, which thanks to Matt Haddon and also for Jeff for taking it. And um, Emily and, and Matt um, and their third, who I happen to unfortunately not know who was the third on this boat at this time, but um, they did a really, uh, a really good uh, blow through jive at this point. And so we're just going to go through the video here and we'll just watch it one time first to actually be able to just see what's going on and and as long as you guys can see that video, we're seeing it in full playback speed and you can see the boat turn nicely through. The kite never luffs. The, you know, the boat never really loses, loses speed and, and they're off again to the races and they're clearly, I believe, in uh, first in this race, I think I want to say, or they're clearly way ahead of the rest of the fleet, which are somewhere back in the distance. So, um, Certainly they felt good and, and they and they showed off in their jibe that they that they could do it. But if we really get into the nuances of what's happening in this uh, and we start to play this video back here, we can go back and we can start to play this video in a lot slower motion um, to actually see what is going on here. So if we rewind a little bit in our video and we actually take it backwards for a second, we can look back to where they start the jibe. And at this point in the video, you go, you go from being right here where everyone's sitting on the rail and everyone's happy and going through the steps of the blow through drive. Everyone's happy. Everyone's going down when the boat's going really well. And as you watch this video advance, you actually see right in this frame, in this frame here, and it might be a little bit harder because the quality isn't uh, awesome uh, coming through internet connections, but you can actually see the forward crew move. And what they're doing, and this is basically if the whole jive takes six or seven seconds, which it does, 
what they're doing is they've scooted their butt back a little bit and they're reaching for the new sheet. And the key here is that they get the slack out of what is going to be the new spinnaker sheet on the jibe. And they make sure that it is completely untangled from anything on the boat or people in the boat or anything else that it's going to be tangled in because that's going to be your first stumbling block for doing one of these jibes and it not working out right. So you can see we play forward a couple more frames and this is roughly a second later. And you see the boat do this slow turn down initially. And I think my biggest thing is the key to the blow through jibe is the slow initial turn down. This keeps the, the crew from being surprised by the jibe happening. This keeps everyone on their feet. They can start to sit on the rail. They can start to get their feet under them and get themselves going. It also makes it so that the flow doesn't really attach from the boat. You're not losing a whole lot of speed unless you turn down really slowly. You're not losing a whole lot of speed here. You're just kind of taking it and coasting downwind for a second. And you can see the turn isn't slow, but it definitely happens a little bit slower initially. And then the second half of the turn gets a lot faster. So we've paused right here. And what we can see is the next step. Our first step is getting prepared. Our next step is starting the turn. And our third step is going to be as the turn comes down, the trimmer pulls one big armful. It's about three feet of the, what is the current and what is soon to be the previous uh, spinnaker sheet. And what that does is that actually pulls the clue of the spinnaker back. So as the boat turns downwind, when you pull the clue of the spinnaker back and the boat turns downwind, the kite tends to fill and float up. So that clue coming back actually straightens the foot. And as you can see in the video here, you can see that the foot gets straight, but the top opens and the sail starts to, it already starts its inversion. And you can see this in the wrinkles that form in the kite right there in that film, you, in that frame. You can see the wrinkles form in the kite and that's from Matt trimming the sheet in and pulling the kite back. And as we turn through, he's gotten that three feet of trim back in, which allows the kite to backwind and fall somewhere, the clue of the kite falls somewhere between the mast and the jib and the forestay. It's just gonna land on the jib and fall somewhere between the mast and the forestay. Do we want it behind the shrouds? No, because if it's behind the shrouds, it's gonna end up too far back. It's gonna end up not being able to get through. If it's in front of the forestay, then we've done a different kind of jive. But we want it to be kind of just landing right on the jib, just sort of between the jib and the forestay. Uh, the forestay and the, and the mast is what we're looking for. So we proceed through the jive a little more, and you can see at this moment right here, because of that trim back in on the bottom of the sail, and because the top is open, you can actually see that the bottom of the sail is almost filled on the new jive, even though we're not there yet. It's actually not filling because of the wind changing direction. It's filling, filling because of the boat changing direction. And that's the most important thing in this is that the kite filling because the boat's changing direction on this new side and it's getting pressed. And as we turn more, then the wind starts to help even more. And the top is still open and drawing to leeward on the leeward side. So we continue the turn here. You see the main come over and you see the boat start to heel a little bit, which we'll talk more about in a second, but you see the kite backwind. And as soon as it backwinds against the jib, that's when the release happens. That's when the release of the person trimming lets go of the old sheet and starts trimming the new one. And a lot of people always say, oh, well, you're going to have to pull really hard on the new sheet and, and, and I've got to, to pull really hard on it. And the answer is not really, because when this is going through, there's actually no wind pressure on that sheet. It's just, it's totally dead. There's no pressure on this kite right, right now. It's actually trying to get through. So all you need to do is work really hard to be really fast at getting in what is slack sheet at that point. So we go through this the rest of the way. And we see the boat finish its turn. The kite fills, it never lops. The boat finishes its turn up, flattens out, and they're off. Now there's, there's one piece in this that I wanna talk about a little bit, which is what happens in the middle of this drive. And again, Jeff, if you have anything else to add here, please 
feel free to dive on in. I'm sure that people are going to be anything at all. Um, yeah, I'm sure that people are. Let me let me just add this. So I I videoed the whole regatta because I wasn't sailing, and I went back and watched these videos uh, last week, and I think this was the only jibe that I saw that was as beautifully uh, executed as Matt and Emily, and I think it's Justin Howard was crewing with them. Okay. Um, and it's just it's just fascinating how beautiful it is, and then the, the others are like, oh, these poor folks. You know, I, I hope they get around the, through the turn. But uh, this is just gorgeous. Yeah, it's it's really nice. Um, the one thing I want to talk about here, and as you'll see in the next slide, I'm actually guilty of it too. And I, in talking to Matt a little bit, um, it sounded like. They were they were discussing this on their boat as well, and it has to do with the speed of the turn. And if we just watch this video through in a little bit of a higher speed, so we'll just go and we'll increase our speed just a little bit, our playback speed, and we'll rewind back to when this all starts, which is right back here. So we're watching our playback speed here a little bit faster. You're going to see at the point when I pause the video or don't pause the video, it's a certain point you're going to see the boat stop its turn. And it's right there. The boat stops its turn, the kite fills, and then it continues its turn up. And that moment, if we just rewind back to that moment again, and we're gonna pause it, and we're gonna see right when the boat stops, look at the amount of jet wash that's coming off the back of the boat. It's coming off the tiller, it's coming off the, the, the back area here. And what's happened there is that the driver has felt the boat heeling over and has pulled the tiller to windward to stop the turn. Because if they continue to turn here, the what's, what's gonna happen is the boat's gonna end up on its side. You're gonna get wet, right? I mean, that's, that's what's gonna happen in a situation. If they stop the turn, they can stop the boat from getting wet. They can stop the people from getting wet, but you end up slowing the boat down because of the massive rudder movement in it. And you can see, we go back to it, all of a sudden at the end, there's that hard turn up right at the end. So we've done two extra turns. We've done kind of this S turn in the middle of the, in the middle of the jive. And that, that um, I'll show you in the next video is something that I'm guilty of as well. But what it's done and the reason for it is not the driver. The driver's reacting to what the boat's doing. It's that at this situation, this point right here, and on any real blow through jive, you don't need to roll the boat because the crew and the team are the, the 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 heat the writing moment that the crew hiking creates is actually what accelerates the boat out of the jibe on the other side not the heel angle and jeff and i have talked about this a lot and you can fill in as to why you think that everyone wants to you know wants to do this this uh this nice roll jibe on a blow through but at the end of the day the crew at this point right here they should be getting to the other side of the boat and committing to crossing the boat long before it even heals and the key there is that you have two options at that point. Either you turn the boat completely and everyone's hiking and the sails catch the crew from falling in the water, or you don't turn the boat completely and the crew gets damp and the boat heals to weather. And those should be your two options as opposed to the alternative, which is that you fall over to leeward. You want to commit to getting to the windward side so much that if it doesn't work and something goes wrong, you end up heeled to weather because that's the only way that you're never going to be able to be flat. Uh, you're never going to be able to be uh, accelerating as fast as you possibly can out of the drive without, without being, without being flat out of it. So Jeff, yeah. fill us in on what, what you're I was going to say, I think the you, you probably want to go to the next video um, of you, you and Hayden jiving the two different times. Um, yeah. Because it really, I think it illustrates more clearly for everybody what you're talking about. Um, you know, with some of the steering and some of the weight placement um, that we that we talked about yesterday. Um, so, uh, I'd like to hear you go through this these two jobs and and explain again what you just were talking about about Matt and Emily. But it was it's tricky to see on the the video of Matt and Emily, but it's really clear on here. Yeah, so that's interesting. Um... This is, and as I said, I'm fully guilty of it. And in fact, I'm in um, much better resolution and much closer than, than, um, 
the uh, the video of Matt and Emily. So good on you guys for being farther away when when um, you did a little S turn through your drive because it's very clear in this video. <laughs> And you can oh, see it. Oh, another thing, um, those videos, that video of Matt and Emily is on the, um, I think it's on the VX1 Facebook page. Uh, it, it, so you can see that in higher resolution later if, if you want to look at it. Right, exactly. Um, so anyway, we'll go through this video and we're just going to watch and you're going to see the turn happen and you're going to see I'm sort of preparing for what is uh, mostly a blow through job, not quite. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more on that later, but you see the boat is flat and you see my body starting to move across the boat. But the immediate thing you notice is that Hayden is not nearly ready for me to turn. And it's totally my fault. I haven't given him enough time to be ready for me to turn. And so he's still on the lured side. So the reaction, of it is I've turned the boat and you can see the end of the tiller turned as we go through here. You can see the frames going through and you can see the white on the very end of the tiller, which is occurring right here on Hayden's body. And this is the point when you know this jibe is going to go badly. Even though it doesn't look that bad from the outset, it's not going to go well. It's not, it's not going to look the best it could look. The kite is not past the headstay yet. I'm on the weather side. The boat's still turning. Hayden's on the leeward side. At this exact moment, what Jeff is referring to is, and what I'm referring to is that we both need to be moving to weather. We both need to be going to weather, committing to the turn. So if we follow through with this, because the boat heels over, you can actually see my tiller come to weather, and then you can see it come to weather even more. My tiller is up here now, and you can see the big wave coming off the back of the boat as I stop the turn and how much the boat's healing over because we just weren't ready and the boat wasn't flat and we weren't able to accelerate out of this. So I had to stop the turn in order to be able to accelerate out of it. And so we get, we finally get out and then I complete the rest of the turn, that second half, that second turn. There, there's the so second like, half right there. Yeah, that sharp second half. Yeah. yeah and then it takes it's off. Yeah. So it, that, that's an example, although, Seemed like it was a nice job with the with the kite control, a reasonably nice. The the crew weight was all out of all out of whack. Right, and it and, and it, it came and it down really, to that all triggers from the communication, um, as as you pointed out, that the, the skipper's got to really let the crew know to get ready, and then really you don't want to turn the boat until you see that they're ready or they say they're ready. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And if you, I, I got a little bit of comedy out of this, which is that if I rewind here to the end of this, you can actually see Hayden looking back at me and <laughs> we, we have a discussion here about, you can see it right there. We have a discussion here about what happened, and um, yeah, <laughs> we're talking about the, about the situation and how it unfolded, which is funny. Um, so anyway, we talk about the next drive here coming up and this is one where, I actually think that it went quite a bit better and there's a bunch of reasons why. And this is sort of the hybrid slow turn jibe, but it's still sort of a blow through. And the only difference between the two of them is that you are releasing the sheet as soon as you possibly can on the, as soon as the boat's turning down, you're starting to release the sheet and you're going on the weather sheet on the new, on the, on the what is going to be the new sheet as soon as you possibly can. Um, very early on on a on a what is the slow turn jive versus the blow through where you pull about a three and a half feet onto the jib and you allow it to to backwind. So we we go through this jive and we'll and we'll watch what's going on here. And you can see Hayden get ready. You can see him lean in in a couple of seconds here. And there's probably a little bit of a delay between what I'm saying and what's happening. So he leans in, he gets ready. I start my turn. And if there's a little delay, I'm probably starting my turn right here for you guys. And at that moment, we're both on the rail. We're both on the weather rail. The boat is flat going into the jibe. But as you can see, I'm already starting my motion. And actually Hayden's butt is off the rail and he's already starting his motion too. And you can see that at exactly that moment right there, I'm pushing off and Hayden's pushing off too. And the difference here is that on the previous drive at this moment, the boat was already starting to heal 
On this drive, the kite is doing the inversion that you're looking for. The clue is already past the headstay. The boat is dead flat and we're both leaving. We we'll both leave the rail and you can see right here, I can complete the turn without slowing down with still less heel than I had the last time. And we're both exiting the rail. And even before the kite fills right here, we're both already sitting on the rail about ready to hike. And if you took the kite away, the boat would flop over to windward. But the kite, we know the kite is gonna fill and we know it's gonna happen. And so we get out the other side, the kite fills, and you can watch the boat accelerate as we're already hiking and we take off. So if we watch it in full, in, uh, full speed here, we can do a quick normal mode, go back to the drive, watch it in full speed here, going through the turn, exiting the same time, flattening, hiking, kites full, and we're off. And we're off to the races. Two other things, two other, go ahead, Jeff. And the cool thing is you, you didn't steer twice through that turn. You just right. carved one, one, consist, one continuous turn um, versus turning the rudder and straightening out the boat in the middle of the turn, just like right there. And that job. Just like what happened. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Which I think is a big, a big difference. The other thing, if you watch really closely, the other part that's the key to the jive and to the acceleration is the ease. You, the sails are in to be able to fill, but they need to be eased because as you accelerate, they're going to need to be eased. And you can watch right here, the way the boat, you see the kite start to ease and you actually see the boat start to pull out of the frame. You watch the boat, we can watch it again here. Yeah go through and you can watch for that moment that the kite eases at the clue of the kite eases in two one eases right there and then you can watch the boat start to accelerate and i'm trying to make sure that my talking is the same as what you guys are seeing in the video so i'm delaying a little bit and if it isn't it's right it occurs the ease occurs and i'll pause the video here for you guys the ease occurs right right when the boat you, it's easiest to see on the main, and you can actually see the boom drop out. But basically, if we go back a couple of frames, the boat is heeled over on its side, and we go back a couple of frames here, and at one exact moment, frame to frame, the boom changes a lot, and it's right there in those couple of frames. If we go back and forth through them, you can see how much the boom changes and how much the kite gets eased right at that exact moment and just how the boat flattens and takes off. Jeff, is that yeah. fairly? Yeah, and, and um, you know, as we were watching this yesterday and talking about it yesterday, we, you, you had some, maybe you want to throw some comments in about the, um, the, the wash coming off the back of the boat and the transom, but what we, came to the conclusion is that it might be better not to have so much roll and heel in the boat at all. It's, it, the boat is gonna go fast when it's powered up and loaded and trimmed rather than trying to generate energy out of the roll by rolling the main and the kite, the trimmed kite to weather. And so something I wanna try is, is moving the crew together at the same time and trying to keep the boat more level. I, I know that for many of us coming from slower downwind sort of uh, soak mode boats, the roll is really critical to getting some energy out of the jibe. And in these boats, it, the jibe is so quick. Uh, I'm not sure that the, that, the, that the roll is better. Is, I think the roll might be worse than the heel angle of the hull. Um, I agree. And you can... Yeah, go ahead. You, you can see it. And, um, you know, if we go back to this video here, you can see it is that that wave off the transom is actually only created by the hull digging in right there. You can see the hull dig in and you can see the wave come off the back of the transom. So if we go back to it again, we can go through and we can pause right there and you can see the hull dug into the water, the boat being heeled over and that wave that this tidal wave just coming off the transom of the boat. You know, you know, as, I think of, 
as I think about this some more, when we're sailing in soak low mode, the roll jive might be the right thing to be doing. But we're in mm -hmm. when we're in planing mode, my suspicion is we want to keep the hull at the right angle of uh, heel, never exceeding too much heel on one jive or the other. Or in between them. Well, it's going to go flat in between them as it both rolls from one side to the other. But, but yeah, at any point, you don't want it to heal more one way or the other as well. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that, that kind of um, helps, is going to help drive coordinated crew movement um, that you, you got to communicate, get ready, and everybody pretty much is going to start to move at once. Right. It's something to something to also visualize here on that crew movement side of things is the slow turn down initially and then how much faster the boat turns through the second half of the jot. And that in itself is going to really help the crew movement. So you can see how slowly the boat turns and gets down to dead downwind. It's quite slow. And then right at the last bit, we do a pretty harder, a much harder bat turn is the last bit to get back up to speed. So it's a pretty big, a big difference in, in keeping it flat and, and, uh, and getting the crew, getting the crew weight out there. And so. you know, another thing I'm thinking of now is uh, so many of these slow boats that we grew up sailing, like a laser or flying Scott or Thistle or whatever, you had to do an S turn and a jive. The boom came over and then you, once the boom came, you knew, once you knew the boom was coming across, you had to, uh, bear back off. And that's, I think that is a kind of residual in some of our sailing style, but it's not appropriate anymore. And it's almost like you got to untrain yourself and retrain yourself. Um, yeah. The interesting thing is that in, in a laser or a, uh, you know, or one of some of those other boats where you can roll jive, you almost exit the jive when you flatten, you exit the jive faster than you went in. In a VX, you, the whole time you're in the jive, you're slower than you should be. So you're just doing everything you can to get back up to speed and back on the plane. And I think yeah. that's one of the big differences. The other thing I get asked a lot from a ton of people is how do I know how far to turn? And, and I think this is a, um, it's a great subject because how do you know how far to turn without the boat healing over or any of that? And the one thing that I use is I either have a Windex on the top of the boat, on the top of the mast, or I have the telltales on the shrouds. And whatever direction the tail of those telltales is pointing, just slightly windward of that is going to be a pretty good example of where I need to turn through. Because that's going to be 180 degrees to your apparent wind angle, which is going to be almost exactly where you need to turn to to be 180 degrees of your apparent wind angle on the other side. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting, a pretty key little piece to the jive and how you get through the other side and, and where you can turn to. Now, with that said, it's not perfect, but if you use that, at least you give yourself a reference point. You give yourself something that you can look at, that you can say, okay, that's where I should be jiving to. And then the next time you jive in that same breeze condition from the last time you said, oh, I was too low last time. So the next time, now you take your reference and you can go a little bit further than your reference. Or, you know, in the, in the, in the alternative, oh, I went too far. Now I can go a little bit less. If you're going to a different venue and you don't recognize the shoreline and you don't know how far you turned, you're just sort of guessing every time, as opposed to having something that's on your boat that's a reference that you can say, this is where I should be turning to, or this is where I shouldn't. Thinking about the actual angle degree that you turn to, that's the solution to the, to the problem. That is one of those things, and we're gonna talk about it a lot, is that is one of those pieces that is the answer we are looking for how do we get to the answer and getting to the answer is using our tips of, Oh, let's, you know, let's look at the Windex using, using what tells that, that I would use in the boat or Jeff would use in the boat about things that, that we might look at to be able to give us clues to what the answer is without saying, Oh, the answer is 96 degrees and you turn through 96 degrees on your compass, but compass is delayed and it's slightly, it's one knot less and you hit a wave badly as opposed to, oh, it's, it's that direction, the way the Windex is, or it's just, just beyond the Windex. And you find that point on land, you look at the point and you say, that's what it is, you jive to it and off you go. Or even if it's a cloud or it's a boat on the horizon or it's something away, it's something, you know, it's 
those things aren't going to be are going to be changing from the time when you decide to jive to the five seconds after you've turned through the jive. And if they are, it's probably a jet, and you probably shouldn't have used it at that. You know, because I'd be surprised that you could see it. <laughs> One thing that I often use is the jib. Is it's kind of a giant telltale. And you, you know how it was flying on the one jibes. So when you're on a new jibe, it should be flying at a fairly similar amount of trim, whether it's slightly over trimmed or slightly under trimmed. Well, it's harder, harder to tell if it's over trimmed, but if it's under trimmed and luffing just a little bit, it should be the same. Mm -hmm. the, other, mm -hmm. the other thing I like to do is I don't really use telltales and my masthead fly seems to always end up in the bottom of Sarasota Bay. So I just look at the spinnaker. Um, and, and it kind of tells me a number of things, and one of which is, how is the crew doing? How are, how are they managing the kite? But if, if you see that the kite's come in and it's trimmed and it's, and it's ready to go, then you can, then you can uh, heat up. And then you have the heel angle to warn you that you're too hot. That'll keep yeah. you down. Yeah. Although I'm going to have to learn, I think, how to use less heel angle in this. I would also say the the interesting thing is uh, you can you can use the reference as well. Look through the shrouds, line up something on land, and uh, and then turn to that, and you know it's either behind that or in front of that for the breeze condition for the future. You know anything that you can use as a reference point to give you the answer. The answer is not the math at the end. The answer is the thing that you're using as the reference point, which I think is interesting. Anyway. Um, so we've belabored that long enough here, uh, but just going through these again, again, really nice drive here, boat gets through, but it's that one thing about keeping flat, keeping it going. And what we said we would touch on is the slow jive. And I think the only difference between the slow turn jive and the blow through, as I said, is that three feet of sheet being pulled back versus just turning the boat through and easing the sheet as fast as you can. Where does the crossover happen? What are, we, what are we looking for in the crossover? And I really think the crossover is the time when you are looking to roll the boat through the jive in light air, that's when you really don't want to use a blow through. You'd rather just float the kite forward because you have to turn through so much more wind, so, so many more degrees of, of angle along the horizon. I'd rather float the kite through there or in really breezy condition where a blow through is possibly getting it wrong is, is, uh, is not, is going to, you know, not be good for the outcome of your race. You could use the, the lower, the lower mode jive, but looking at the two of these jives and going back to, and going back to this one here, you can actually see that while we're doing the slower turd jive and not really doing a blow through, it's not that much slower compared to the blow through when we get it right. But the outcome is very similar. And, and the key here is that, you know, rolling a roll jive in light air is, pr is probably the answer. And these sort of flat, uh, quick ending turns, uh, either doing the blow through, which is the three feet of spinnaker back, or doing the early ease sheet on quickly answer is, is the real difference. So we have this notion in the class that these are two very different jives, and they, they really aren't. They all take coordination, but they all mostly take turning the boat at the right speed at the beginning of the jive, turning it at the right speed at the end of the jive, and uh, and going through it. Jeff, anything anything on the jiving? No, I I think do, do we want to take some questions here? Is that a possibility, or should we want to just? Oh yeah, so, so so Jeff, it's Brian again. I just want to. I mean, I'm I'm sitting here mesmerized by you guys talking, and uh, it's 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 really really fun to watch. You know, one of the things, Jeff, that struck me is you guys are talking about the choreography mm -hmm. between the driver and the trimmer. And, you know, I know you've, you've trimmed a, a bunch of spinnakers over, over your career. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are of how you handle it. You know, we see Hayden kind of, and, and uh, Mike kind of with their choreography. I'm, I'm wondering as a spinnaker trimmer, what are you thinking about during the job? What, you know, Mike did a great job of kind of explaining foot position and, and when to move and stuff. But, you know, you're, you're so focused on the kite. What are your thoughts about, you know, what do you need to take care of to do a good job as a trimmer? Well, for sure in a boat like this, where the it's turning so quickly, you've got to have your feet underneath you and you've got to, basically, you've got to have your legs strong enough to be able to stand up from a crouched position. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm prepping with that, or, you know, I'm, I'm, 
preparing myself for the day of sailing with, with, you know, that, that sort of fitness, but then just in terms of the jive itself, you know, you you fundamentally most important thing in these boats is make sure you're not stepping on the sheets or somebody is not sitting on the two sheets. That's rule number one. Rule number two is um, I make sure that both sheets are in your hands and you're ready to go. You're, 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 either up on your feet or you're ready to get up on your feet and there's nothing stopping you from doing that. And it's, when I say get up on your feet, I mean in a crouched position, uh, ready, ready to go. And then it's, it, it's a, such a small spinnaker, it's really not a whole lot of motion. Uh, not, it's not a lot of feet to trim in or uh, pull back. And this year I've been, well, last year I was really trying to learn how to do some better blow jibes. And I think that the, uh, the critical thing is to trim the, sheet, the, the old or the current sheet in first. And uh, as we were talking, it's maybe three feet or so. And that then uh, after the jibe, then you trim in the, the new side quickly. And as Mike pointed out, you've got to get it in, but then it has to be eased immediately uh, as it begins to fill. Otherwise it'll cause the boat to just heel right over and wipe out. Plus the the, the, the drive on the kite is m so much less efficient if it's over trimmed. Yeah. So it's really, I guess the, the really cre critical thing is being ready and then being ready to ease the kite out once it has filled into the new side. I think that's what you mentioned, Mike, right? I mean, being able to, you know, take the ease and unload the leech on the kite so the boat kind of jumps and takes off, right? Exactly. That's, that's what I thought the key was at the end of it was just to be able to get the you know, you, you get the sheet in to get the kite filled. And as soon as it's in, you ease it. it. As soon as it pops, it gets eased and the boat takes off and accelerates. Yeah. As a skipper, you can just feel the helm load up until that kite is eased out. And yeah. you, it's, you know, being both a skipper and a crew, it's like, I know exactly what needs to happen. And when I have a crew that's new to the boat, uh, you, you have to really explain to them how critical it is to ease that kite back out after it's uh, gotten, after it's refilled on the new side. The, really, the, it's really important. I, quick, I really quick hope. Note before, oh, sorry, Mike, real quick, just a quick note for everybody, and Jeff had mentioned that the chat room is open for questions. So if anybody has any questions or is curious about any of this stuff or, or you want uh, Jeff and Mike to, to, you know, kind of, answer a question, just just throw it in the chat room. We'll do our best to kind of manage it and uh, try not to get Zoom bombed here a little bit. But uh, anyway, uh, yep, feel free to, to drop stuff in there if you have any questions. And guys, this is, uh, this is really fun, kind of cool, exciting stuff to watch. You guys are doing an awesome job. So I would, my one thing is I hope someone had the question of how much ease is enough ease. <laughs> because that's, that's my, that's one of my biggest things is when people ease a foot or or two feet. And, you know, if one of these times we get Hayden, we could ask him the question or, and the good thing is we have Jeff because Jeff has sailed with me and knows how much ease is enough ease. And it's, it's an armful. It's, it's two armfuls. It's, it's enough so that you can actually see it in here. The luff of the kite starts to, starts to collapse. It's enough that the, the kite is on the, on the verge of collapsing. You do that, you know, four feet, three feet, four feet, five feet of ease to get the kite just flowing. You gotta, you gotta let the boat accelerate and get away. Yeah, I, really I, 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 don't, I don't know that it's necessarily a, a, a known distance or length, but it's basically you're just returning the kite to proper trim as quickly as possible after it has refilled. Right, exactly. Um, and and uh, as I said, as a skipper, you feel the helm all loaded up until that kite is eased out. Even if you're just yeah. sailing and not, you haven't jived and the kite doesn't get eased in a big puff and feel the helm all load up. And it's just, and if somebody eases it while that puff comes on, you feel the boat take off and accelerate. Right. It's, it's pretty cool. It's cool how these boats uh, reward us with sailing it and you know, trimming it correctly. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so a quick, quick question for you guys. And uh, during the jive, there's, uh, you guys, I don't think you touched on other than side to side uh, crew location fore and aft. Uh, are you moving your weight fore and aft at all? If the when you, when you're popping out from a decelerated situation to popping the boat up on a plane, do you guys slide back a little bit? What do you where your where's your fore and aft positioning during you know in this case these 
these particular wind conditions. Do you think much about that? So I, I'll actually go back to that slide because it's it's interesting. Um, the fore and aft position as we go through it, I'm not I'm not stepping over the tiller. I'm in front of the tiller. But if we go through the one that was the actual way in which it should be done, if I had a third person, I think that third person would either be between or in front of Hayden. There's a body width there to be able to do it. If you watch through my choreography, I'm actually putting I get the tiller uh, the extension. If we, if we were to go back here just a little bit, one of the first things I do is I hold the main sheet up in the air and I get the extension past it and under the boom. So now I have full control of the tiller and that's why I'm leaned in there. And so now if you watch my hand, my move when I turn is I actually write, uh, I gotta go back to it here, but my move when I turn is I actually put the tiller on the windward tank, uh, on the windward side of the boat. and I'm turning, but the tiller is locked in. You can see the tiller hand is still turning. My head is facing upwards and looking at the horizon. I'm looking at where I'm going. But you can see that I've got the, windward, the tiller hand and the tiller itself on the windward side of the boat. I'm in front of the tiller, and there's enough space in here for us to fit. If we had a third person it was light air, we'd probably have the third person in front of Hayden. If not, we'd probably have the third person probably already crossing before the spinnaker trimmer does. Because again, anything we can do to keep that boat dead flat during that drive is gonna be really critical. And you can see I stand up, and as I stand up, you can see when the transition happens before my hip is against the side of the boat right now. And you can see the, the transition of the tiller behind me as my, with my hip on the side of the boat. And it, it's, uh, you know, and then, the, and then the transition happens, it's behind me. I can hike and I can ease the main. And you can see that that pull that I do with the main sheet hand right at the end here is to get extra tail on the main sheet where I pull it up towards my ear. That's to get extra tail on the main sheet because my next move is gonna be able to ease it. So I pull it and I'm pulling the tail end of it and then I ease it right there. So I think that's a that's a big one. So I, and uh, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, that's what most of the questions have been about, have been about uh, fore and aft uh, placement and then who's crossing first and whether we're crossing all at the same time. I think the choreography depends a lot on the size of the people, but I would say that what you're trying to do really matters on it, it, the biggest thing is keeping the boat flat through the drive. And when you exit the other side, having people ready to hike and ready to go. Yeah. You know, so a couple of weeks ago when we were sailing in Miami, I sailed with Bill Wiggins and uh, Darby Capellan and uh, Bill, on a couple of times, she, she said, you, you, you ran into me on when you came across the boat and we wiped out one time because of it. So with three people in the boat, it's, a, it's, it's much more crowded and the middle crew has got much less, well, the kite trimmer has much less space to move around and have to be really sensitive that there's somebody else behind you who needs room. And another thing is we, we, we were, it was very windy in some of the races. So we were all the way in the back of the boat, but it was really important to get forward in the boat before we started the jibe so that Bill didn't get launched out the back of the boat um, on the jibe. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing I thought of is uh, two years ago, I sailed with three and the skipper was having a hard time with the tiller extension. And we realized that with three people, you need to have a shorter tiller extension. Um, with two, you could have a much longer tiller extension because there's a lot less bodies in the way and the, and the middle crew is uh, not a problem with, with two people, but with three, the shorter tiller extension makes a big difference. Can we, uh, can we get the chat box to guess what event that was? You don't have to tell anyone. I know which event it was, I think. Anyway, sorry, neither here nor there. What event it was where you were sailing with three. I know what it, what it was. Anyway, um, so, so it, I think that's a, that's a lot on the driving, and it's a lot of, um, and it's a lot of bits and pieces. But I agree. I, I think there's a lot of choreography that goes into it. My biggest takeaways are keeping the boat flat, but also as a driver, I worry about getting the tiller extension to the new side of the boat, i.e. under the boom and the other side of the main sheet when I have a long tiller extension. 
And, uh, and I worry about that. And that's my biggest thing, because if I can get that to the other side of the boat, it frees me up in that previous video. It frees me up to move a lot more because I, I don't have to deal with that much of a long tiller extension. I don't have to get it by anything. It's already on the other side and it's out of the way. So that's my, that's, that's what I really, really focus on for that. Um, yeah. I, I, I want to just repeat that because it, it took me, I never did figure that out how you do it with lifting up the main sheet, put the tiller extension under underneath the, the main sheet to pass it across to the, to the, well, the lured side. I had to ask somebody, I'm like, how do, how do you do this? I kept getting all tangled up in the thing. And yeah. that, that's the answer. You, you lift the main sheet up and pass the tiller extension underneath it, below it, down to lured, swing it down to lured. And you get, you get the end of it the, on the lured side of the boom before you jive is really the key. So... So anyway, moving on to um, if there's, and I'm sure there's going to be more questions on that. Moving on to something that we're going to we're going to touch on a lot with four and a half movement and that kind of stuff is downwind, and you know I, no one's going to argue that there's two modes in the VX. Uh, there's the low mode, which is kind of flat boat, people sitting in, people you know the boat's going kind of slowly. It's not as fun as it normally is, and then there's the high ripping mode, as we all like to refer to it, which is just the I want to go fast mode and uh you know the boats in the photo here are clearly in the ripping hiking i want to go fast mode and i think there is a key between all of them speed is king the boat is an apparent wind angle boat the boat sails on apparent wind and what that means is that you have to keep the bow up you have to keep the boat going fast in order to be able to in order to be able to 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 go lower so you can point the boat dead downwind but you're not going to get to the lured mark before the other boats because you're not going fast enough. But if you get the boat going fast and you keep the bow up and you, you get, you know, hiking and, and, and John Potter and, and uh, Goobs do a really good job of this about hiking and going fast when it gets planing mode. Um, but you, you keep the bow up, you keep the boat going fast. And this goes for both modes. You have to keep the boat going fast before you get the angle. The angle will come by going fast. And that's really the crux of what it is. In the low mode, you're looking for weight forward, and we'll look at that a lot. And in the faster mode, you can start to move back. But I do also think that a lot of people move back too quickly in the faster mode. So we'll go back to this video, and I want to go back to the middle of this video, because there's a really good section here when we're going downwind. And the thing that I want to show in this video is I want to show that the fact of the what, what's happening with the boat here is that the boat is at the same heel angle the entire way downwind and in reality if you sail the boat correctly the apparent wind angle doesn't change so what that means is that when the puff hits the apparent wind will shift uh will, will shift backwards and what happens is because the breeze is coming from over the over the back side of the boat when you're going downwind so when the puff hits the breeze will come over this boat, it'll shift backwards. What it does is that accelerates the boat. And then what that means is that the apparent wind then goes forward. So when the puff hits and the boat heels over and you get that acceleration, the acceleration is making the apparent wind go forward. And as you do that, you get to turn down. So in reality, as far as the boat sees it, the apparent wind angle never changes. So your spinnaker trimmer has a really easy job once the kite's filled in on the edge of luffing. They, the, the apparent wind angle is the same. So the kite is not really going to change. It's not really going to need to be eased or played. What it's going to need is going to need that quick ease, maybe a foot when the puff hits to allow the boat to go down and leave that heel. But it's not going to need this constant easing and trimming that we see on a lot of uh, symmetrical boats. And so if you watch this video through, you can see once again, like the upwind, look at this corner of the boat and look at how much of the bottom we're seeing. It's a constant heel angle. The boat isn't, the boat isn't healing over. It isn't changing. The apparent wind angle is going, is the same the whole time. You can see the kites just staying there nice and nice and comfy. We'll go back and look at it again. But the key here, I think, is crew weight. And this is the up and ripping mode. And we aren't that far back. But I think the important thing is actually looking at I look over the top of the bow and I look how far over the top of the bow the water seems to be away. And if you look here, you can't see the knuckle, but the only thing you're trying to do when you move back in the boat is you're trying to get the knuckle of the boat out of the water so that you don't hit a wave and go into that wave. 
And if you look here on this, we're just far enough back that the knuckle of the boat is just touching the waves. Any further back, and we're increasing the drag in the boat. We're, we're dragging the stern of the boat lower down, and we're increasing the drag in the back. Any further forward, we, we're potentially going to hit waves. So a lot of times people have the, you know, and I'm guilty of it too. It's breezy and you move back immediately. As soon as it's breezy, you move back, you move back. But it really has to do with the wave state. It has to do with the fact that if it's really wavy, that's the time that you need to move back because you have to keep that bow from being, you know, the, the, the average of that bow should be above the top of the waves. If it's super flat water and windy, you could sail with the weight almost all the way forward because it's, it's really not, you know, you know, obviously it'll all the way forward, but you can sail it a lot further forward because you're not, you don't need to drag the stern in and you, you're not trying to get that knuckle of the bow out. In reality, when you're moving the weight back, you're pushing the stern in. And so the more you push the stern in, the bigger this wave behind you gets. And it's much more obvious in the low mode. But in this mode, if you're too far back and you have a big wave off the back of the boat, that's just drag. So as you get going faster, the water gets harder relative to the boat. And therefore, you can move further back because the boat doesn't sink down as much. As you go slower, you have to move further forward. So the idea, everyone says, oh, I've got to get the bow out of the water. It reduces wetted surface. That's not, that reduction in wetted surface isn't a huge speed gainer. The huge speed gainer is keeping the stern from dragging. And, and sometimes you have to compromise the stern dragging to keep the bow out for so you don't crash into waves. But otherwise, you know, as you get going faster, you can move further back. But until you have a reason to move back, you, you really don't want to be too far back too quickly. That's one of the big things that I focus on a lot. So Mike, you're more focused on, on where that knuckle's hitting more than anything else. And I think you know, if I heard you right, and maybe I misunderstood, the whole key, especially when you're starting to get waves, make sure the knuckle's out more than 50% of the time. And, and, yeah. and you move back a little bit further, you just push it a whole lot more boat and dragging it in the water and making it go uphill. And, and so, uh, but somebody did ask a quick question. Do you, do you listen all about, uh, listen to the wash off the back of the boat or, you, or is your focus still entirely on what you see in the front of the boat. Can you, can you gauge anything by how, how much a boat's sitting in the water by, by listening to what's going off the back or are you still focused mostly on the front? Totally, uh, totally listen to what's happening on the back of the boat, but only in the low mode. In the planing mode, whatever's happening back here is so far in the, in the past, it's, um, you know, it's, it's already, it's already happened kind of thing. In the low mode, if you can hear water behind the boat gurgling, you are too far back almost guaranteed in the low, it, it, not almost guaranteed, it is guaranteed. If you can hear that water gurgling behind the boat, 100%, that's a, that's a really good tell that I use um, a lot of the time. But, but for sure, you know, you can see that Hayden and I, it's, it's, you know, probably 13 knots right here, it's downwind, so it looks a lot uh, lighter than it is. Uh, but you can see we're only about one body width behind the shrouds. We're not that far back, and it's mostly because it's such flat water that we're into. The, so we can skip forward a slide here and we can actually look to the low mode and we can look to this four and a half movement that we're talking about. So the big thing that we talk about in the low mode versus the high mode is, you know, the high mode is when the boat can jump out of the water and that's what you're looking for it to do. If you turn the bow up and the boat never jumps out of the water, you're just sailing high in a deeper hole. And this picture right here shows it perfectly compared to this one. These boats are in light air. They're in the same condition. They happen to be almost right next to each other. These pictures are taken next to each other. This boat is going for the higher mode and you can see the big wave off the back of the boat and you and the boat can see it. You can look back and see this big wave off the back of the boat. And look at this boat. This boat doesn't have this big wave off the back of the boat. You can see the hole this boat is trying to dig. So, this goes back to your crew weight. This wave and the gurgling is partly by crew weight, but it's also the quick tell to say, yeah, I'm way too high right now because I'm turning up to use energy and I'm going higher, so I'm not going as much downwind, but I'm just using energy to dig a deeper hole in the ocean. And that is the biggest thing that I think if I had to you know, have the takeaway for when the transition is, if I can't think that I'm getting 
out of the water and actually hopping up, that's when I say I should be in a low mode versus the high mode. And these three pictures really show it. This, this is a super low mode. You can see the kite starting to collapse. It's too low. We've lost a parent when the kite's collapsing. This is turned up a little bit more. We can see the kite starting to fill again. The clue looks like it's, you know, actually is pulling on it. This is that's way too low and this is just too high. And you can see how deep the boat's, you know, the boat is and all those pieces you can see when you're on the boat. You know, we, we always say it, you know, oh, it's easy to see when you're off the boat, but you can see this wave when you're on the boat. You can see the kite sort of collapsing and drooping. You can see the clue of the kite starting to fall when you're, when you're on the boat and, and knowing, and those are the tells that I use to know if I'm, you know, in the right mode. Where is the transition? I think it's around seven knots, seven, eight knots is what I think. But again, it really depends on whether you're digging a deeper hole in the water as opposed to getting the boat moving forward. Jeff, any, any additions yeah, on that? So, um, again, going back to Miami a couple of weeks ago, uh, I, I totally blew it. And we were in the low mode when we should have been in the high mode. And what I, as I thought back on that, I'm like, well, how, how could I have known which was the right one to do? Well, what we had done was jogged away from the fleet and sailed off by ourselves in the low mode. What I learned was, don't leave the, if you're not sure what the mode is, stay with the fleet or stay with a couple of boats and match what they're doing and then decide, then, then use that information to decide which one you want to do. Um, sometimes, you know, tactically, you got to go in the high mode to get over somebody who's slow. Um, and sometimes you got to go low and slow to get on top of somebody's wind or get into a spot where you'll be able to jibe on their wind. So it, you can switch, but if, if you aren't sure about which mode you should be in, uh, look at the other boats that are near you and and if there aren't near boats near you get over to where they are so you can check um, yeah that was a that was a a real you know wake-up call um we sailed the whole leg by ourselves and we lost 100 boat lengths to the guys we rounded the mark with i've got a good a really good slide on that um coming up next, but I want to, I want to touch on one other thing on Bang, and I think that that's really important that I don't math on that subject about matching the boats around you and, and speed before you match angle. One question I get a lot is Bang, and you can see massively different Bang uh, notes in these, you know, before we move away from these, and, and how do you know when the Bang's right? And everyone says, well, I, I want the leech of the main to match the leech of the kite. Well, can I see either of those when I'm actually sailing? And the answer is no, not at all. You can't possibly see either of those when you're sailing. They're, they're off the boat. So how do I want them to match? And I use a really, there's two, re, there's two ways. One, in very light air, I'm looking for, if I go to pump the main and I, and I, and I give it a quick, sharp pump, and in this case, what's going to happen is the bottom battens in the main are going to come in, and the top one might even open outward, right? When I pump the main. And in one of these cases, when I pump the main, all of those battens, all five of them are going to move in and they're going to flick at the same time. And that's how I know my bang is right in the low mode. It's, it's if the, you know, you can see this main looks way more open than the leech of that kite does. And you can, you know, when you pump that main, those top battens are just going to, they're going to flop to leeward and the leeward ones are going to, the lower ones are going to come in. So I want them to, when I do that little pump on the main in very, in the lighter air, and it's just a test, I want the battens to move together, but I want them to flick. Now, if I pump the main and the battens are just stiff and rigid, I know I've got too much bang on. And, you know, you see it routine and routine again, that when you actually do it in that way, you'll see that the bang does match the leech of the kite when you are off the boat. But how do you know that when you're on the boat? That's what I use. In the bigger breeze for the Vang, the thing that we, we see a lot is how do you know? And what the main is doing in the bigger breeze is the main is actually giving you drive force. The bottom part of the main is giving you drive force to get you up on the plane and get you going. And the top part of the main is giving you roll moment. So in very light air, when you're trying to get up on the plane, you might want roll moment and drive force. And at that point, you probably want a little bit more Vang on because you want to keep the top of the main attached to give you the roll moment to get you going. 
in as the breeze starts to pop up and 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 hop up a little bit you still want the drive force out of the bottom of the main so you want you don't want to have to ease the bottom of the main all the way out just to keep your boat flat so you start to ease the bang to make it so that you can trim the bottom of the main in and get the drive force and well the top of the main is really twisted open and and keeping the boat ripping forward and uh and not healing over and that's the thing that i think about with it so i'm always looking to keep the boom over the corner of the boat and I'm, I'm always looking for that and you'll see this in that video and i'm setting the van so that i can keep the boom over the corner of the boat when i'm going downwind and if that if i find the boom is too far out that's because i'm easing the main too much to depower the top of it so i'll ease the van a little bit and i'll pull the boom in versus the alternative if i find that i've got the boom on center line it's because I don't have enough bang on and I'm not getting enough drive force and heel moment out of the top of the main that I'm looking for. So I'll pull the bang on to keep the boat rolling. Is that, Jeff, does that thought process make sense for the van settings? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm learning here as you're going along, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the main, the, the, the uh, you know, where to sheet the main, how far in, and how much bang to put on is, is always a good question, but I'm quite happy with the answer you gave us there. So the, the last thing I wanted to go back to, um, and Brian, do we have any questions on the on the downwind, uh, sort of the bang tension, the sail control tension thing before we get into what Jeff was talking about, which is, which is the two different modes and when you use them and what's good and what's bad and we get into this video. Well, Mike, there's, there's the only question kind of that we kind of see hanging out there, and I, you've done a really good job of covering a lot of this stuff. But uh, one of the questions um, is really, I think, covered in this video that you're going to talk about a little bit. It has to do with maybe uh, picking jiving angles, which you, you may want to touch on. I know you, you have some notes here about how, uh, how speed kind of kills, right? And, uh, you know, kind of picking your jiving angles going into lured marks uh, or attacking lured marks. And I, I know Jeff has some notes about that, too. So... I think if you kind of go through this video, maybe I'll help people understand uh, a little bit about what they might have been asking about. Yeah, I think that's a really great one. Um, how do you know where to turn to? And what is the apparent wind angle you're looking for? And I said it before and I'll say it again. The apparent wind angle is the answer. How you know where to get there is, is what the boat is asking for. It's what the boats around you are asking for. It's what Jeff is talking about, which is, how you know what to get there is at the end of the day, you have to be going as fast as the boat around you because you have no chance of getting past them if you're slower than them. Now, what you can say is, oh, well, I was lower, so I was, I was going, uh, you know, I was a little bit slower and my VMG was better. If you are lower, then yes, you're making a slight gain by being lower, but you're also slower. So you've got a negative in the fact that you're that you're slower and you've got a positive in being lower if you are if you are high and fast your apparent wind is going to move forward so you're going to be automatically a little bit lower than someone who's maybe a couple of degrees lower than you are but not going as fast you are you are going fast and you're not necessarily that much lower so your cliff is very wide. You're very far away from the cliff if you're going fast. The boat, is, the boat is always on speed. Your apparent wind is always forward. The amount of boat length losses that you can take are pretty small. If you're going low in that low slow mode, if you get slow and you, for some reason, lose two, two knots, three knots for a second, the distances are much larger. So here's where that math that I was gonna talk about a little bit comes in. The math comes in that one knot of boat speed is equal to 1.7 feet. So in a VX at, uh, what is it? it it's at basically at six knots, uh, it takes you, so if you're doing one knot and, and only one knot of boat speed, which you almost never do in a VX, it takes you 12 seconds to cover one boat length, right? So at six knots or seven knots, it takes you half that time, right? At seven knots, it takes you you know, only four seconds to cover. The really interesting thing here is that it, as the breeze gets lighter and the differences in boat speed grow, it is really easy to lose a lot of boat lengths. I can be going two knots faster than you and I am immediately, and over the course, if I'm going just even a knot faster than you or two knots faster than you, over the course of 12 seconds, I'm gaining two boat lengths if I'm going two knots faster than you are. 
That's the, that's the really important thing about this. At bigger breeze, the percentage difference at 16 knots versus 15.5 knots is quite small. So the differences you see aren't that much, but in the light air, it makes a huge difference. This also goes back to, when, so when people always ask what angle should be, I be sailing? The answer is high. You have to be sailing fast. You have to be sailing fast. You can't get the boat slow. You're in a potential double losing scenario by being low and slow, as opposed to being fast and high. At least you're faster than the guy. You may be a little bit higher. At least you're faster than him. That's the key. And the key really comes down to the fact that one knot is worth, it is two feet per second in a VX. I get the question a lot as well, the, 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 the jiving. How many times do I jive on the downwind? Tactically, where do I want to be? A jive, if you have someone's boat speed at, for five seconds, which is all the jives that we've seen, we've seen jives and we've seen five of them, and you have your boat speed and you go from 16 knots to eight knots in a jive for five seconds, you've given up six and a half boat lengths to the boats around you. Six and a half boat lengths to the boats who didn't drive. What that means, tactics in a VX downwind, unless there's a really big wind shift that you're going for, there's not a lot of reason to drive when you're doing 16 knots because you're giving up just so many boat lengths. Bad air, you're already going slow, time to drive. But if you're not, if you're in clear air, you know, this tactics downwind in a VX is a lot of just keep the boat speed up, keep the boat moving, keep the boat moving forward. And that's going back to what Jeff was saying, which is, which is really a lot about making sure that you're always fast and you're always going. Now, what apparent wind angle is it? I don't know. It's generally the, over the side of the boat. But at the end of the day, airing on the side of speed is the better side to air on than on the side of going too slowly. And we'll watch it. You can watch it unfold in this video, which is we're going to watch this video from a little ways into it. And we're going to see what's happened here. And, and we'll just pause it right here. We've got Brian Shores going by. Great kite, by the way, Brian. Anyway, great kite color choice. Um, anyway, uh, we got Brian going by and we see three boats in the background here. We see two, two blue spinnakers and uh, we see, oh, I can't see the numbers on, so I don't know who they are. I happen to know that this is Tim Pitts and this is Bill Wiggins. And we're going to just keep an eye on the yellow and blue spinnaker here. And Tim has gone into the high ripping mode. And these three boats are all following each other. And they're in the lower mode. Tim ducks all three of these boats. And as we watch this unfold, these boats are all going in their low slow mode. You can see the waves coming off of Tim's boat. He's moving. He's going fast. All three of these boats do one jibe. Tim does one jibe. Remember, he ducked the gray and red kite here. And as we watch it unfold, when he stays in his ripping mode, people wait out ripping mode. If we watch it unfold and everyone's going, when we get to the finish line here, the number of boat lengths that have been gained by the person who was in the high and ripping mode are huge. Just in the course of that small distance, he's gained probably two or three boat lengths. Yes, these guys were diving down to the line, but it also comes down to the fact that potentially diving down to the line at the finish isn't the answer in these boats because it doesn't gain you that much. And you can just see how much the losses are. Yes, their, their drive isn't quite perfect, but a couple of these boats have good drives. You know, they have good drives going through. Bill has a good drive, but you can see the boat that he initially ducked, that Tim ducked, he is now in front of coming across the finish line. And that, I think, is the biggest way to show what we're talking about here with this, um, with this video. Oh, boy, what's happening here? We got a little slow there. Um, I think that's the biggest thing, at least for me, in watching this video and talking about the numbers. Jeff, does that kind of show what, we're, what yeah. you were talking and, about in that slide? Yeah, and, you know, as I think about watching it with Tim there, you know, he's going fast, but when he goes through the jibe, He's not slowing down nearly as much. Right. His jibe is, is he's, he's faster through the jibe. So because he starts with more speed. Right. Uh, so he's, he's in a jibing mode much less of the time. Just, yeah. Um, I think it's pretty interesting. And I, and I think that sort of answers the question that you're, that you're getting there, Brian. 
you know, and this vote in 277, uh, they were probably a significant distance out here in the background, but they came in full speed the whole time and they're in front of that whole pack. These boats were probably in front of them at a different mark, but they've gotten slow from going that low slow, that low downwind mode and this boat's just jumped them on it. And you can see the huge difference in what it is. So, you know, for me, when the question comes up, how do you know what angles to sail? Speed, 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 speed. Because when you really think about it, the cost of being slow is huge. Being a not slower than someone else in 12 seconds, you lose a boat length on them, as opposed to being, you know, and, and, in, and in five knots, a not slower is a, you know, 20% decrease in speed. And 16 knots, a not slower is a, is a, you know, whatever it is. Or if you're doing 20 knots, a not slower is a, you know, it's a 5% difference in, in, uh, in speed between the boats, but still over 12 seconds, you're still losing a boat length on it. So, uh, you know, Mike, uh, obviously this is a great example. And for a lot of people who have, you know, these um, high performance sport boats like a VX1, it's kind of new for a lot of people versus coming from, you know, like Jeff was mentioning displacement boats, a lot of us have sailed for years. Uh, but just, uh, you know, obviously the, the two blue kites and, and the red white kite kind of got into a spot where they're trying to get down to the mark, right? And, but it does show you when you do go slow, how much distance you give up. And, and Jeff, you, you were mentioning to us the other day about kind of watching boats go into lured marks, which is sort of the kind of same thing, right? Uh, you know, whether you're finishing or going into a lured mark and the distances you were noticing that people were losing because of, of maybe some opportunities to practice their takedowns a little bit more. You want to maybe touch on that real quick? Yeah, so, um, so all of these videos uh, that I shot at the North Americans are available, I think, on VX1. They're, they're not the best quality because I uploaded them while I was out there on the water. I believe Ian ha has them, and um, they're in a – let's just see if we can get these videos in a higher quality mode um, up to the uh, private owner's page. But here's what I observed as I went back and watched the mark roundings. Um, so many of the boats took down their kites way too early. Sometimes uh, as much as the kite was down and put away with three boat lengths to go. And you can just see how much distance they're giving up. Um, and then there's a couple of mark roundings. Paul Curry does a great job of it. He comes in. Uh, he's on starboard. He, he's, he's going fast, fast, fast the whole time. And he takes his kite down right at the end, right as he, right as he's, uh, you know, the, the kite is almost put away by the time he's turned up into the wind, but he starts to take down maybe mm, not more than three boat lengths away from the mark. And it, the, the, uh, the amount of distance he gained on the boats that had taken theirs down and were sailing sort of deep with just the main and jib was shocking. And, and so many of the boats, as I watched the mark rounding, took their kites down way too early. Um, now, so the, we, did, the, uh, we discussed the, the hazard of coming in there too fast with too many boats around, and that's a different question. But if you have um, a, a clear approach into the mark, let's say there's nobody there, um, don't take that kite down too early. Um, do, be, do, do know how long it's going to take. Uh, Got to be confident with your crew. And if, if you're not, then yes, taking it down early is much safer. But if you have executed good takedowns, um, push it a little bit. And um, it's, I, I personally think it's okay to be coming around the mark, turning, turning into the wind with the jib still eased out and the kite maybe another you know handful of lengths to come back down in, maybe maybe four feet to come back down in. Because you don't want the jib trimmed when you go around the mark. You, you want it to be eased slightly. And if the kite's still up, it's no big deal. Uh, I mean, obviously it's gotta come down quickly after you pass the mark, but if the transom passes the mark and the kite goes in, that's, that. I'd be happy with that. So a couple of quick things, Jeff, just to add to that. You mentioned about building the confidence. And obviously one of the big ways to do that is get out there and practice it, right? I mean, if you're only three takedowns or four takedowns of the day, or at the four lured marks, um, you're probably going to have trouble building the confidence to do it. So, you know, getting out there a little bit earlier, if you're, if one of the things you want to get a little bit better at is, is those high speed drops, 
um, the best way to do it is get out there early and go practice them. I mean, that's going to build the most confidence. And then um, the other thing that I thought was kind of funny when, when you mentioned to Mike, you know, uh, you know, it's okay to kind of, I'd rather have the jib luffing and kind of pull the <laughs> kite up. And Mike said, well, uh, I'd rather go around with, uh, you know, go downwind for a boat lake with two sails than try to go upwind with three. So, <laughs> but uh, anyway, you know, that, a lot faster. Uh, <laughs> that all circles back to practice and, and, and the opportunity. And that's one thing I think that, that especially when you're, trying to experience a new boat and all the tips you guys are talking about with create, creating speed. Uh, that's probably going to be maybe your best opportunity for doing that, but it was pretty cool. You mentioned the other thing is uh, Ian uh, sent a quick chat here that all, uh, all the videos are in high quality in the VX one public page. Uh, okay. With an exclamation Great. point. So that's <laughs> anyway. Okay. Um, Great. And, and um, uh, hopefully you'll, know Go, real wait, quick, wait, Mike, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, before, before you dive in, I know there was a question about angle and stuff and you, you've been hitting on that. Uh, there was a little typo. Um, but I just want Curtis uh, to know that, uh, you know, his question was, uh, where's the gynecologist and where is he located, he or she located on the boat? Uh, usually the gynecologists, the lawyers, the doctors are holding the tiller, right? <laughs> and, and the rest of us are hanging off the side getting wet. But anyway, um, anyway, just a little typo, but hopefully that, that answered Craig's question about your, your angle and how important it is to keep the speed up. Yeah, I think speed is, speed is king. And, uh, you know, just to what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of finish up here because we've gone uh, pretty long with uh, with all of this. And, and I think it's been um, it's really it's been really great. And having Jeff here has been really awesome. But, you know, just to kind of recap on 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 the stuff we're talking about, the blow through and the slow turn jives, they're they're not all that different. You know, it's it's about consistency. It's about practice. It's about the rate of turn, uh, slow in, fast out. It's about finding your exit angle, uh, no roll uh, through them flat boat and committing to get the weight to weather before you need it to weather. Because you have a, uh, what is it, 40, 140 pound piece of lead hanging off the bottom of the boat, right, Jeff? And uh, that, yeah. that 140, 160 pound piece of lead is not going to do a lot for you with the spinnaker up and the jib up. So committing to get the weight across is, is critical in, in all of those. And then the light air jibes, it's, it's rolling to, you know, in that slow turn jibe. And then the big takeaways that I had in the downwind are speed before you match angle with other boats around you. And, you know, the boat is an apparent wind angle boat. It's, it sails by going faster. It goes lower by going faster. You can't start out by going low. And so I think that that's a really big key for both the low mode and the ripping mode. And then I think the transition, knowing when to, to go up and down, really depends on how big a hole you're digging in the water. If you can turn up and not dig a hole in the water and go fast enough that the water is hard enough that you are, that you are, you know, not digging a hole, then you're, then you're in, should be in planning mode. But if you can't, then you, you probably should be in the low mode. And and then the Vang, the piece I have on the Vang is 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 really, you know, it really has a lot to do with the battens are flicking and if you know what you're looking for the main to do are you looking for the main to drive the boat forward and not tip it over or are you looking for it to tip it over and and uh and and drive it forward and if you're looking for only driving it forward that's when you would be bang ease mode which tends to be bigger breeze and if you're looking at for it to be tipping you over and driving you forward that tends to be lighter air and uh and less breeze and you know driving forward and i think those are the big the big takeaways for for me on it. the the one thing i wanted to add there on the um the takedowns is before the north americans this past year um uh, you were mike you were really diligent about soaking the coat with or the kite with mcglue and the uh the, the bag that goes down through the center of the hall as well um and that can make a big difference, especially if the kite's a little bit older, but for sure a, a new coat, a new kite ought to be coated with uh, McLube and there's some other fancier stuff that's available, but it really helps the kite slide in the tube quicker and not absorb as much water. So little. Our Harkin, our Harkin rep here. <laughs> 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 no, I agree. I think it definitely, uh, that definitely, definitely, definitely helps. Um, anything you can do to stop it from getting stuck because the, uh, the biggest, the biggest thing that helps you get that kite in is momentum of pulls. And anytime you lose the momentum from it getting stuck, you're, it's, it's hard to regain it. 
when the kite's already dragging on top of the water. So I think that's good. That's a good one. Awesome. Sorry. Yeah. So Mike, you, uh, I know you're getting towards the end of your, your, your deal here. Just a couple of quick things for everybody. Um, one is obviously, uh, we mentioned this before, it, now's a great time to support the class by renewing your membership. Uh, you know, if you, it's, it's Friday afternoon and great time there. Hopefully you can click off of this webinar here and click over to the VX1 website and just, uh, just get your membership up to date. Uh, the class right now, uh, not that much money to, to make sure we're keeping the class strong and supported. Uh, there was a question about where the webinars are gonna be uh, updated. Every North Sales webinar is gonna be uploaded to our YouTube channel. It takes us a couple days to kind of go through all the content and uh, make sure it's all uh, uh, at best PG rated. And so we, uh, it takes a couple days to get up, but uh, everything we've done so far is on the YouTube channel right now. So feel free to go and, and take a look at those. Uh, there's been a couple of folks asking about, uh, about the next webinar. It's probably going to be a few weeks. Uh, I know Mike, um, has done a great job of preparing for these. Uh, we're gonna try to space them out a little bit we're, while we're still waiting for, uh, for the opportunity to get back out in the water. We're going to uh, try to sort of space these out a little bit, give you some time to think about questions that you can submit to Mike and uh, maybe uh, ideas for the next, uh, next webinars and the next guest. So uh, anyway, wanna uh, kind of thank uh, Mike for putting all this together and Mike, maybe uh, you have any final words? Yeah, uh, thanks, Brian, and and uh, you know, big thanks to you, Jeff, for uh, for jumping on here and putting your thoughts in, and and uh, you know, having your your insight into these things because uh, it's it's definitely very needed, and it's a it's a different perspective on it. So, looking forward to that fingers crossed time that we get to get back out on the water, and uh, yeah. you know, as Brian as Brian said, uh, you know, definitely uh, put put in any comments or send me notes of anything that you want uh, for the next, the next webinar, because um, you know, it's uh, I, I enjoy doing them and hopefully they're helpful. And if anyone has any further questions, feel free to reach out to Jeff and only Jeff for further questions. No one else, <laughs> only Jeff. No, I'm kidding. You can <laughs> reach out to anyone, you know, either of us and uh, we'll both be, both be happy to help. And uh, that's, you know, one of the big things that we love about the class. So awesome. Yeah, thank, oh, yeah. thank you. Right. Mike. Thanks. Yeah. All right, guys, again, thank everybody. You. All right, Jeffrey, it's good to see you again. Everybody do, do us a favor, be safe. Uh, send your, send your messages on to Mike.Marshall at NorthSales.com. And on behalf of North Sales, we appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, be safe and enjoy your weekend. Thanks guys. All right. Well, good evening. <laughs> Take care. Goodbye. See ya.